The Federal Reserve Bank just elected to raise interest rates by another 0.25% even after all the craziness that we've been seeing in the banking sector. After Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank and the Credit Suisse emergency takeover, we've seen a lot of people get worried about their bank, so they've been pulling money out of regional banks, moving their money to big banks, and there's been a lot of debate and controversy over if the government should and will continue to rescue depositors if a bank goes under. So what I want to do today is talk about what this new 0.25% interest rate hike means, what Jerome Powell said about the banking sector, what he said about inflation, because he gave some interesting information about inflation, and what he said about the future of our economy. I know this video is going to be a little bit longer, but I really want to break down everything you need to understand. So please watch this video until the end, because there's a lot of really important information that you want to understand. First on the topic of inflation, because I think that's going to help lay the foundation of everything that I'm going to discuss. Jerome Powell said that now they expect inflation to end in 2023 at 3.3%. That is their estimated target. The reason why this is important to understand is because in their most recent statement, they said that by the end of 2023, they expect inflation to fall down to 3.1%. So they originally expected inflation to fall to 3.1% by the end of the year. Now they're saying they expect inflation to fall to 3.3%. Why does this matter? Because it shows that the Federal Reserve Bank is saying again that inflation is going to stay around higher than expected and it's going to stay around for longer than expected. And the reason why that's so important is because just a few weeks ago, Jerome Powell, who is the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank, met in front of Congress. So the Federal Reserve Bank is its own independent entity. It's called the Federal Reserve Bank, but it's not federal, it's not a part of a government. It says so on their website. They're not a reserve, they don't keep cash reserves, they essentially print money, and they're not a bank. You and I can't go there to deposit money. But the Federal Reserve Bank, although they're not a federal, they're not a reserve, and they're not a bank, they are the central bank here in the United States, and they have the ability to, one, print money and lend this money to the government, and they have the ability to set interest rates. So now, Jerome Powell, in his meeting with Congress, so he was meeting with the government, he was talking about how interest rates are going to have to go higher, and they're going to have to be more aggressive with interest rates. This is in the early part of March 2023 because inflation wasn't coming down fast enough. The reason why the Federal Reserve Bank raises interest rates is because it's a way to cool inflation down. And so a few weeks ago, he was in front of Congress, the government saying expect interest rates to go higher than expected and we'll probably have to be even more aggressive with their interest rate hikes. After that happened, we saw everything kind of collapse in the banking sector. First, it was Silicon Valley Bank, then it was Signature Bank, then Credit Suisse, and we still have a lot of other uncertainties in smaller regional banks here in the United States. And so now, in the Fed's most recent meeting on March 22nd, Jerome Powell said that it looks like inflation is going to stay around higher and longer than expected. But at the same time, Jerome Powell only raised interest rates by 0.25%, because like what the Fed was saying before, that they need to be more aggressive with interest rates. The whole thought was that they would raise interest rates by 0.5% in their most recent meeting. Instead of raising it by 0.5%, they raised it by 0.25%, and then they raised their projection on where inflation would be by the end of the year. The reason why this is so significant is because you're really starting to see a change in tone by the Federal Reserve Bank. Before the last week, it was, we got to do whatever it takes to bring inflation down to 2%. It doesn't matter if it causes pain in the economy. It doesn't matter if it causes layoffs. It doesn't matter what breaks. We have to get inflation down. Now, as of the most recent meeting, Jerome Powell says, yes, we have to bring inflation down, but we don't want to break the banking sector. We don't want to break the economy, so we're going to take it a little bit easier. This is the first time you're really seeing such a drastic shift by the Federal Reserve Bank. We covered this entire thing in Market Briefs, by the way, if you read the story this morning. Market Briefs is my free financial news editor where my team is breaking down what's happening in the financial news, when it's happening, and we even created a new section in our news editors that's breaking down what's happening in the banking sector every single day. That's actually why I have this wheel behind me. We did a free giveaway, and somebody won a free MacBook from Market Briefs. So if you haven't joined Market Briefs yet, you can win a whole bunch of free stuff, and you can stay educated 
educated on what's happening in the financial news when it's happening, plus it's completely free. So if you haven't joined Market Briefs yet, I got that link for you down in the description below. But this is where now I want you to understand the shift in the Federal Reserve Bank and why this is so significant. Because on one hand, Jerome Powell says that they are committed to bringing inflation down no matter what it takes. But now we're starting to see them say that we might not be continuing to raise interest rates as aggressively. The whole tone that Jerome Powell gave was essentially that we may have to keep raising interest rates if it is warranted. So before it was, we might pause interest rates if we're seeing the success. Now it's, we might keep raising interest rates if it's necessary. So you're starting to see the shift in tone where the interest rate hikes don't seem as important to Jerome Powell. And part of the reason why has to do with the banking sector. And let me read you a quote and then explain, I'll explain what this means. He said, quote, recent developments are likely to result in tighter credit conditions for households and businesses and to weigh on economic activity, hiring and inflation. The extent of these effects is uncertain. So Jerome Powell is essentially saying that with these most recent bank failures, we're going to see a tightening in the credit markets, which means the lending markets. And if we see a tightening in the lending markets, that would also help cool down inflation. So what does that mean? He's saying thank you to these banks for collapsing because that will hopefully help him on his inflation fight. See, in our economic system, there's two kinds of money. You have money, which is the money you work to earn, the cash in your bank, and then you have credit, which is debt. We live in a credit-based system, which means people have the ability to spend not based off of how much cash they have in the bank, but based off of how much credit they can qualify for. So if I go to work and I earn $100, I can spend the $100 plus another $100 from a credit card company. See, if I could only spend $100, that means I can only spend $100 at Gucci or wherever. I can only stimulate the economy by $100. But if I have the ability to borrow an additional $100, that just doubled my spending power, which means I can spend $100 at Gucci and another $100 at Chipotle. Now I can stimulate the economy even more. But due to what Jerome Powell is calling the recent developments, aka the bank failures, he is saying that we're going to see a, tr a tighter credit condition for households and businesses, meaning less lending for home owners and people, not just homeowners, but just regular people, less lending for people and less lending for businesses. That means, remember, the two different types of money, you have money and credit. That means the credit available in our economy would go down. Why does this matter? Because inflation is a byproduct of how many dollars are in our economic system. Inflation comes from the word inflate. When you inflate the amount of dollars in our system, you're inflating our monetary supply, you are increasing inflation. The reason why we're facing so much inflation right now is because we printed so much money in 2020, 2021, and 2022, plus of all the previous deficits and spending that we did before the 2008 crash and all that, and even to the 2000.com burst, all this money printing was bottled up and this inflation really started to surge now because of the excess monetary supply. And so what he's saying is that, yes, the Federal Reserve Bank is working to reduce the amount of money out there. How do they do that? By making borrowing money more expensive. But because there's pain in the banking sector, that's going to reduce the amount of credit out there, which should also help cool and ease inflation. At least that's the goal, and that's what the Federal Reserve Bank is going to be keeping their eye on. And because now they believe that the credit is going to be decreasing, it seems like Jerome Powell feels like they don't have to be as aggressive on interest rate hikes. Now, it looks like inflation is still going to be around. That's why they're predicting inflation to be higher than they expect by the end of 2023. But it'll be interesting to see now if changes in the economy will really impact what the Federal Reserve Bank does. And uh, to really emphasize this a little bit more, Jerome Powell said, quote, the committee, aka the Federal Reserve Bank, anticipates that some additional policy firming may be appropriate in order to attain a stance of monetary policy that is sufficiently restrictive to return inflation to 2% over time. So do you see that change in tone? He says that additional policy firming, aka higher interest rates, may be appropriate might might be appropriate in order to attain a stance of monetary policy so 
raising interest rates might be appropriate to bring inflation down to 2%. The reason why this is so important is because before his last speech yesterday, it was, we have to raise interest rates to bring inflation down. Now, because of the recent pain in the economy, you're seeing a complete flip in the way that he's talking. And the reason, again, the reason why this is so important is because of how, how serious inflation is. An economic disaster or an economic slowdown, a recession is painful. But an inflation crisis is even more painful. We have seen economic slowdowns in the past. In the 2020 pandemic, we did see an economic slowdown for a little bit of time until the Fed and the government opened up the money printer and started stimulating the economy. We saw an economic slowdown in 2008. We saw an economic slowdown during the 2000.com burst. These were periods where we saw an economic slowdown. But it's been a long time since we've really faced an inflation crisis. The last time we really faced an inflation crisis was back in the late 1970s. And even then, to bring that inflation crisis down, the Federal Reserve Bank had to raise interest rates significantly higher than what we're seeing now. Back then, to bring inflation down, mortgage rates had to go up to above 18%. Not 8%, but 18% because of how hard it was to bring the inflation down. And the reason why interest rates went so high was because that was the only way that the Federal Reserve Bank and the government could then avoid a currency crisis or hyperinflation. Hyperinflation in a currency crisis essentially means that the value of your currency, the value of your dollar is dropping significantly. And so it becomes less attractive to work for dollars. You're going to work to earn dollars, but your dollars can't buy you enough things. So it's much less attractive for people to work. Businesses can't hire employees. Employees want a lot more money. Businesses can't sell their products for enough. It creates a lot of issues. This is why, you know, I've been talking about how this inflation problem is very serious because bringing inflation down to 2% is going to be more difficult than what the Federal Reserve Bank anticipates. They hinted at that yesterday. They didn't say that outright, but they said that because they're talking about how inflation is going to be higher than what they originally expected. And you can probably expect that as we go through the year, they will continue to raise up their adjustments on where inflation will be by the end of the year. Because just recently, they said inflation will be 3.1%. Then they said it's going to be 3.3%. And it won't be long before they say it's 3.5% and higher from there. This is the same entity that said that inflation was transitory and that inflation would be completely gone by 2023. And now they're saying it would be 3.1%. And then they said it's going to be 3.3%. So this is where, again, understanding that bringing inflation down is going to be difficult. And if the Federal Reserve Bank does make a complete pivot and they say, you know what, we can't continue fighting this inflation problem because the economy is a bigger pressing need, well, that means that inflation will continue to run hot, which has its own problems. Because inflation running hot also slows down the economy. And inflation running hot also hurts our currency. And inflation running hot also extremely hurts the middle class. Because inflation is one of the biggest reasons, if not the biggest reason, why the middle class gets eroded because inflation reduces your buying power. It means your salary cannot buy as much and it means your savings cannot stretch as far. Who gets hurt the most? Well, it's the middle class. Because now you're working to get a paycheck and you're making too much money to qualify for government aid. Your paycheck isn't growing fast enough with inflation, which means that your housing costs, your rent, your grocery costs, your vacation costs, your gas costs, your, your car costs, all these things are rising faster than your incomes, which means that now you're working to earn more money, but you're effectively becoming poorer, even if you get a raise, because your raise isn't enough to keep up with inflation. This is why the inflation problem is such a big deal. And our original economic slowdown wasn't caused by higher interest rates. It was caused by high inflation because the inflation was so high that people didn't have the ability to spend. Inflation was so high that people just had to cut back on their spending, which slowed down the economy. Remember, our economy runs on spending. The more money you spend at Chipotle, the more money Chipotle makes. If you save all your money and you don't go to Chipotle, Chipotle is not going to make any money and they can't grow. So our economy runs on spending. The more money people spend, the more money that flows through our economy and the faster that our economy grows. And what was happening with inflation was people had to cut back. You can't buy as much stuff 
because your rent is so expensive, your gas is so expensive, and eggs are so expensive. So now you don't have money to go out and buy other things like maybe a new pair of headphones or a new shirt or whatever because you have to spend more money on your rent. And so high inflation by itself slows down the economy. And then you have high interest rates, which also slow down the economy. And the reason why high interest rates slow down the economy is because higher interest rates slow down spending. When you have higher interest rates, it makes things less affordable. The simplest and easiest example to understand this is the housing market. When mortgage rates go up, buying a home becomes less affordable. A half a million dollar home is more affordable with a 3% mortgage than with a 7% mortgage because the 7% mortgage is going to cost you way more monthly on your payments because you have to pay more money to borrow that money. And interestingly, when Jerome Powell was speaking about what's going to happen with the economy, not inflation, but the economy, he says that unemployment is going to rise to 4.5% by the end of 2023. The reason why that's significant is because he actually raised his economic predictions because recently the Federal Reserve Bank predicted that unemployment would rise to 4.6% by the end of 2023. Now they're saying that the economy, the unemployment number is going to rise to only 4.5%, aka we're going to have less people laid off by the end of the year. Now, if you're trying to piece everything that I'm saying together, you'll start to see the real concerns of why did Jerome Powell only raise interest rates by 0.25% because he's been saying that bringing inflation down is the number one priority. It doesn't matter what's going on in the economy. It doesn't matter what's going on with layoffs. They have to bring inflation down, even if that means layoffs. Well, in their most recent talk with Congress, they also said they're going to have to be more aggressive than originally expected. Now they're saying that inflation is going to be higher than what they expect by the end of the year. They also said that unemployment is going to be better than what they expect by the end of the year. But they're also saying they're not going to be as aggressive with interest rate hikes. So now it's like two completely different talks at the same time because before it was we have to do whatever it takes to bring inflation down. Now it's inflation is going to be around higher, the labor market is going to be stronger, and we're still not going to be willing to do what it takes to bring inflation down. And this is where, you know, when Jerome Powell was talking, one of the things that he kept talking about was the labor market, aka the job market. And what he said multiple times, it's on multiple headlines, was that the labor market is still too strong. We've seen unemployment ratch up just a little bit. Uh, I think we're at like 3.5% unemployment right now. We were at 3.4% before. And what he's saying is that the labor market is still too strong. Too many people have jobs. It is causing a big pain in the workforce. Employers are having a tough time finding jobs. It's causing higher inflation. And so he wants to cool down the labor market, a.k.a. he wants people to have less jobs, he wants more layoffs. That's what he's saying. But what the Federal Reserve Bank is doing is a little bit different. They raise interest rates slightly, even though they're projecting unemployment to go down less aggressively than what they thought. So now you're starting to see a lot more kind of... Uh, Double speak, I guess, is the best term for this, where they're saying one thing, doing another. But this is where now understanding what does this mean for the economy and what does this mean for you? Because for one, the Federal Reserve Bank did raise interest rates. They did not cut interest rates. Higher interest rates are going to put more pressure on more banks. Higher interest rates are going to put more pressure on businesses because borrowing money becomes more expensive and the debt that you already have as a business becomes more expensive because... Well, when you raise interest rates, you have to pay more interest, and most businesses don't have a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. They have variable interest rate debts. So the debts that businesses have, uh, the cost of servicing that debt is going to go higher. And likewise, you probably will see other consumer debts like mortgages go up in the short term because, well, when you raise interest rates, it puts upward pressure on things like mortgage rates, but that's not the only factor that affects mortgage rates. I have other videos that explain what moves mortgage rates up and down on my channel so you can watch those videos. But this is where now understanding that higher interest rates are going to put more downward pressure on the economy. And now the Federal Reserve Bank is going to be keeping a closer eye on the economy and inflation. So if inflation comes in hot in our next report, 
while the economy is strong, then maybe the Federal Reserve Bank will pivot and start being more aggressive with their interest rate hikes again. Like uh, we've seen some banks around the world, I think it was in uh, the Europe, uh, the ECB, the European Central Bank, they raised interest rates more aggressively than they thought, than the, what people thought they were going to do. So, you know, if inflation continues to persist, we might see the uh, Federal Reserve Bank come out and be more aggressive with uh, interest rates again. But if we see inflation come down, even slightly, while the economy continues to be choppy, or even if inflation stays the same, but we see more pain in the economy, that could be more reason for Jerome Powell and the Fed to say, you know what, we're going to take a pause on interest rate hikes and we're going to see where this goes. Now, that might sound like a good thing, just take it easy, but the downfall with that is that keeps inflation around higher for longer, which continues to hurt regular people. And remember, inflation disproportionately hurts the middle class, the poor, and the financially uneducated, and inflation disproportionately benefits the wealthy and the financially educated. And this is where now what Jerome Powell and the Federal Reserve Bank does is going to have a significant impact, not just on inflation, not just on the economy, but on regular people's finances because inflation is still extremely high. Bringing inflation down to 2% does not mean the price of things fall. It means that the price of things stop growing so fast. And right now, the price of things are still growing quickly. They're still growing faster than people's incomes, which means every single day, the average American is slowly becoming poorer. Now, what does this mean for you from an investor perspective? Because the reality is we have a lot of red flags in our economy. We've seen it in the banking sector. We're seeing it in some businesses. You're seeing the housing market go up and down. I mean, we just got a report saying that housing sales boomed again because mortgage rates fell after uh, last month. And so now it's, what does this mean? Well, the first thing is patience because markets move slow and it takes time for the economy to really absorb whatever's happening. So one, you have to be patient. Second, you wanna be financially educated and understand and remember that the investors that make the most money are the people that take advantage of buying opportunities. And I was reading an article where Warren Buffett was interviewed by CNBC, this is an old article, but Warren Buffett was essentially talking about how the best investment advice for regular people is just to buy the S&P 500 through thick and thin, especially the thin. And it was such an interesting thing that he highlighted that because essentially what Warren Buffett was saying is that the way that the average person can make money as an investor and become successful as an investor is you just passively invest your money to the market, whether the market's up or whether the market's down, and especially when the market's down, you continue to buy. That is the way that you can win. But what the majority of people end up doing in actuality is you buy on the way up, you get excited as things are rising and then things are going down. Instead of buying more aggressively, people are selling. And this is where understanding that if we do continue to see more economic pain, because higher interest rates will cause more pain and the high inflation will cause more pain, that's gonna create more opportunities. And when those opportunities arise, everybody's going to be running away. Everybody's going to be panicking. Everybody's going to be selling. But this is where now you, as the educated, sophisticated investor, don't want to be the person that's selling. And instead, you want to be the person that's buying and being able to research those investments. So how do you research those investments? Well, it depends on what it is that you want to invest in. If you want to invest in individual things, stocks or real estate or businesses, you have to be willing to put in the work to learn how to do that. If you are not interested or don't want to do all that work, then the alternative is you can invest in funds. This can be an index fund. This can be an ETF, which stands for Exchange Traded Fund. It could be a mutual fund. These are funds that give you exposure to a basket of stocks. So for example, instead of going out and investing in say the Amazon company, you can invest in a fund that gives you exposure to Amazon and 500 other companies. The reason why this is important is because now if you invest in one company like the Amazon company, 
you have to know how to research the company because you're keeping up with, I mean, you're putting all your eggs in one basket. So you need to know how to keep up with the company, research the company, study the fundamentals, study the finances, which for some of you might sound like a lot of fun and very interesting and enjoyable. But for most people, they dread that idea. They don't do it. And then you just go and buy the next hot stock when it's going up. And then when it goes down, you sell and you lose a lot of money. So the first part is it takes more work. The second thing is Well, the risk, because if Amazon takes over the world, you're going to make a lot of money because you put your money in Amazon and they are doing amazing. The risk is what if Amazon is run into the ground and they have to declare bankruptcy? Now your investment goes down to zero. So you take a much bigger risk versus you can invest your money into a fund, an index fund, an ETF or a mutual fund. I like low cost funds. Cost means your expense ratio, this is the fee that you have to pay to your money manager to invest in this fund. All funds have some sort of expense ratio. If you're investing in a 401k or IRA and investing in the stock market through funds, you have to pay an expense ratio. I highly recommend you look at what your expense ratio is. Uh, The benefit of many index funds and low cost ETFs is these fees are very low, which means more money goes to be invested as opposed to going into money managers pockets. And so now when you invest in a fund, You can invest in an ETF for a fund that gives you exposure to say the 500 largest companies in the stock market. This is called the S&P 500 index. There's a few different ways that you can invest in this. One ETF that gives you exposure to the S&P 500 index is SPY. Another one is VOO. As a disclaimer, I invest my own money into VOO. I'm not telling you what to invest in. Please do your own research. I'm just a random guy on YouTube. I'm not a financial advisor. Uh, I'm just giving you this for education and never blindly trust a random guy on YouTube. Okay, so now with that disclaimer, when you invest in any one of these funds that give you exposure to the S&P 500, now you're investing in the 500 biggest companies in the stock market. If you invest in just that one ticker symbol, you get exposure to 500 different companies. One of them is Amazon. Now, if Amazon were to go bankrupt, yeah, your fund might get hit a little bit, but it's balanced out by the other 499 other companies. Some of them are gonna be winners, so it'll be balanced out. Likewise, if Amazon were to take over the world, well, your fund will go up, but it'll also be balanced out by some of the losers. So it reduces the risk, it reduces the work required, but it creates opportunity for people to invest because the biggest, I think one of the biggest things that holds people back from actually investing and then taking advantage of opportunities is one, they say, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to invest. I don't know what to buy. And you don't have to know how to research a company. You don't have to go out and even invest in individual companies to invest your money into the markets. You can invest your money into funds, reduce your work requirement, reduce your risk requirement, and just own a piece of the market. And even if you don't want to invest in, say, the 500 biggest companies, you can invest in funds that give you exposure to the total stock market. This way now you're literally just throwing your money into the market and you never have to research an individual company. So... This means that you have to research which funds you want to invest in. There are ETFs and index funds for pretty much anything you can think of. The total stock market, the S&P 500, NASDAQ, the Dow Jones, tech companies, healthcare companies, uh, international companies, real estate companies, you name it. There are funds for that. But the key is now that financial education of knowing what to invest in and actually making that investment, which means being prepared. And the way that you're prepared is by preparing your finances. That means you live below your means now, so you have some extra cash to put aside. And that means you work to earn more money. That way you have more cash to put aside to invest or more money that you invest. Because the big mistake that so many people make is they make money to spend it. Versus wealthy people make money to invest it. It's a completely different way of looking at money. And if you really want to become successful and take advantage of opportunities because the reality is recessions and market crashes create more millionaires than any other time. Why? Because people panic and investments go on sale. And now if you are a financially educated person like you are now, you're understanding what's going on in the markets, you're seeing the risks in the markets, you understand that higher interest rates are going to cause pain, that there's a consequence to higher interest rates, you're preparing, you understand the financial education of how to invest. Now it's being prepared because you can have all the right education, but if you don't have access to any money to invest, it doesn't do you any good. So that means preparing, you live below your means so you have that extra buffer and then you work to earn more money so you have more cash either that you're investing or that you can invest. And now it's a matter of just finding the right 
strategy for you? Is it just dollar cost averaging or is it looking for good investments? There's no one size fits all. That's why I don't like to tell people, go out and do this. Don't go out and invest in real estate. Go out and invest in stocks. Go out and invest in REITs. Go out and invest in dividend companies. You can succeed in every which one of these ways. You just got to figure out the right strategy for you. And once you figure out the right strategy, keep investing in a financial education, keep trying, keep learning, and understand that sometimes you will fail. Investing has risks. You're never guaranteed to make money when you invest, and in fact, sometimes you will lose money. It's a part of the game, but you better learn something each and every time. That way you can come back stronger, come back more educated. That way you can make way more money than you lose.